So I wanted to just remind folks that this is a 10 lesson course that teaches ag professionals and farmers how to support beneficial birds on their farms as well as to manage pest birds. So we already had our first lesson and today you're here to learn about what sort of pests specifically um, birds can help control on farms in various cropping systems. Our next lesson will be covering insect eating birds supported by nest boxes and buildings. Fourth will be on rodent eating birds with the emphasis of course on barn owls. Lesson five is how to manage those pest birds, especially with the presence of kestrels to help scare some of them away. Lesson six is to coexist and make farms safe for birds. Lesson seven will cover some of the bird's diet and foraging strategies that can help farmers. Lesson eight, we're gonna start broadening out and cover farmscape and landscape features more broadly. Lesson nine, we're gonna try and harness our inner birds and try and see the land through the eyes of birds. And the last lesson where we can cover how to prioritize what birds prefer on farms. But back to today's lesson. Again, I'd like to welcome everyone who has joined us today. Um, we're gonna begin, uh, hopefully you've been filling out the pre-survey poll that's up on your screen. Um, we're going to then jump into two presentations today, one by Joe Ann, who is the executive director of Wild Farm Alliance, and then the second from Alyssa, who's a researcher with Virginia Tech based in Santa Cruz. Afterwards, there will be a 10 minute session where we will lead a discussion on farming practices and examples of the topic from today. And then we'll wrap up with a conclusion and have another post survey poll. So now I will hand it over to Joanne. Okay, um, are we gonna end the poll now? Let's see, and there are the results, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and, okay. Hi everybody, I'm Joanne Baumgartner. Um, direct executive director of Wild Farm Alliance. I've been with this organization for over 20 years and um, I've worked in agriculture. I've worked in conventional agriculture for five years. I had uh, my own organic farm with my husband for a dozen years, worked for some other nonprofits and then um, ended up here at Wild Farm Alliance. And so as, um, oops, as um, Ryan said today, we're going to cover how many and what kinds of pests do birds eat. And first, I want to share with you some research that Dr. Julie Jedlicka has done. These slides, the next 10 slides or so that I'm going to show are her slides. And um, she spent 10 years of her life studying Western bluebirds, for the most part, in uh, vineyards to see how important they are for uh, pest control or to, to determine that, which you know we didn't know in the beginning. But she put out nest boxes in vineyards in Napa County, California, um, and then had control areas where the nest boxes weren't. Um, and first thing she wanted to figure out was who's using the nest boxes. She found that swallows were using them and um, not or there was both tree swallows and violet green swallows and they together occupied about 17 percent of the boxes the violet greens are so gorgeous and they're in decline so and and both of these birds are insectivores so um it's a good thing that they are using some of the boxes the western bluebird was using almost 37 percent of the boxes um, which is great too, as you're going to see as we get further into the pest control um, 
part of her research. So this slide is showing that there was 10 times greater um, abundance of Western bluebirds when nest boxes were in vineyards compared to vineyards without them. And uh, she wanted to figure out, you know, were they, were they eating insects? So she put some sentinel experimental prey out in the vineyard um, with boxes and without boxes and found that almost two and a half times more of these insects were being eaten um, when the boxes were present. And right near the boxes, it was almost three and a half times. And these were live caterpillars that were put out there. So um, that was really cool, but she wanted to know, well, exactly what are they eating? So this was her team who helped analyze over 200 samples of um, bird, bluebird feces and uh, figure out that. So using this molecular scatology, which is uh, DNA analysis, looking at feces, um, they generated information like this, which if you notice the herbivores or the orange are mainly what they're eating. And um, that includes mostly caterpillars and true bugs like leafhoppers. Um, she also found, nobody knew this, but they eat a lot of mosquitoes. About half of all the fecal samples had mosquitoes in them. And what's really good um, is that only 3% of the beneficial arthropods like spiders and um, predator insects were being eaten by the bluebirds. So she um, found that the, the sage leafhopper, which is very closely related to the blue-green sharpshooter, which is a kind of leafhopper, um, was in ab about uh, more than half of the samples. And um, it was in a year that she had been tracking how many blue-green sharpshooters were on the, in the vineyards and, 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 and they were very low that year. Um, <clears throat> Blue-green sharpshooters vector a Pierce's disease, which kills these uh, really valuable vines. So um, getting rid of blue-greens is a, is a really good thing. And so while she didn't find that they ate a lot of blue-greens because they weren't around, she um, is suggesting that in a year where blue greens are um, in higher numbers that the, the bluebirds would be eating them. So the take home um, message is that there's strong evidence that putting up nest boxes then increases the, um, the bluebird presence and then they can help um, reduce herbivorous insects, including sharpshooters, leafhoppers, butterflies, and moths. And and hardly any uh, beneficial insects or spiders. So the next study I wanna share with you is with Dr. Sasha Heath, and she is an advisor of some of our avian pest control work, which is awesome. And she studied um, birds eating codling moth in walnut orchards. She had known that birds were, eating the same pests in apple orchards. And we talked about that a little bit in the lesson, the first lesson. And, um, and I studied that among um, several other researchers. So she wanted to see how that was gonna affect or if birds were important in walnuts because collie moth is a huge, uh, yeah, it, it's a huge uh, pest for walnuts. So her study, she wanted to, figure out how habitat influenced birds and which birds were there and, and was there pest control. So she set up her study having orchards that 10 of them had a riparian habitat or hedgerows near or adjacent to them. And then she worked with in 10 orchards with, with a clean margin. Uh, she also looked at what kind of habitat semi-natural habitat was in the surrounding area up to 500 meters away from the, the orchard. The first thing 
important was to go out and do transects of uh, out in the orchards to figure out what birds were there. And she also put camera traps up to see, you'll, as we'll see later, um, that the birds, if the birds were eating uh, calling moth that she put out in the orchards. So um, she was finding that there was 10 insectivorous birds, these birds, which um, were probably really important because they are out there and they eat insects off the barks of trees. So it was these birds. And this chart, um, uh, the x-axis is showing the different orchards and um, the upper chart is showing the interior of the orchard where there was mainly two species of woodpeckers or in the woodpecker family, the Nuttles woodpecker and the Northern flicker that were present in the orchards. And that was really interesting. Like, why would they be there in the interiors? As opposed to, we really were not that surprised to see that they were in the margin, that a lot of these different species were in the margins. Um, and uh, I just wanna point out that some of them were like the white breasted nuthatch, cause that's gonna come up again later. So then looking at this margin type, the clean uh, versus um, where there's habitat, um, there was more predators um, where there's margins uh, with habitat. Um, but if you look at how is that margin affecting the interior, there was also um, some uh, influence of the habitat in, in affecting the interior. Um, but there was also something else going on in the orchard um, where there was, uh, you know, these pre um, predator birds in the middle of the orchard. She also was, you know, to a good researcher, looks at a lot of different uh, factors. And so another really cool thing she was looking at is, well, you know, in, maybe the trees themselves are attracting the birds. And so she looked at and found that um, when just looking or um, examining how these three woodpecker species uh, in, the wood, in the woodpecker family um, were present, their presence increased when there were taller trees and when there were more fissures, um, more cracks in the bark for places for the calling moth to hide. And um, likewise, she was looking at, you know, the habitat around the farms and finding that there was more of these woodpeckers um, in, uh, as a semi-natural habitat increase. So here's Sasha. She grew up um, calling moth on cardboard, um, uh, little cardboard pieces and placed them on the trees. Half of them were exposed to birds and half of them, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little cage here where the birds could not get at the, the codling moth. And what she found was in the uncaged areas, the semi-natural hab habitat cover really um, influenced predation uh, as opposed to like you might expect not so much um, where it was caged. There was something going on there though. Um, and uh, then in the interiors, the um, woodpeckers actually increased. It, it didn't matter whether there was a habitat margin, a hedgerow or riparian area on the side, the, um, the woodpeckers were increasing and, um, and, and predating as they increased, they were eating more pest insects. Then um, in the, the semi-natural cover, the simple part, the simple up to 20% of the um, semi-natural, of the, sorry, of the whole landscape would be semi-natural um, habitat that was considered simple. And so um, the, Woodpeck, as woodpeckers increased in that scenario, there would be more predation. But in a complex, really complex landscape that a orchard might be in, while even if there was increasing woodpeckers, there wouldn't be increasing predation. And that was really interesting. And it's thought that 
the the complex habitat has a lot of food there and so it's not really so important for woodpeckers to to make a living in the orchards so she found here's a couple of the um, films from uh, or shots from her camera traps where on the left is the nettles woodpecker eating uh, pulling out a collie moth and uh, the right the wet white breasted nut hatch and altogether she found there was 46 percent predation um, uh, and that's without the the cages and um, 11% with the cages. So if you subtract one from the other, you can figure out that 35% was uh, happened because of birds. So her concluding thoughts are that there's more local and when there's more local and landscape habitat, there's more predators. And when there's more predators, there's more predation. But the surprising thing was that when there's bigger and older trees, there's more predators and more predation, especially in cleared landscapes. So, um, so you know, we're we're slowly unpacking how um, birds uh, interact with us in our agriculture landscapes. Um, what I'm showing you here is a table that we are just finishing creating. Um, what and where beneficial songbirds eat and nest, and it's this is part of fact sheet that we'll make available to you before the next lesson, which is all about nest boxes. And so I'm just gonna go dive a little bit into this as it relates to what I just talked about and what's coming up. And um, so all of these birds will use the same nest box that a Western bluebird will use. Specifically, I talked about nut hatches and you can attract nut hatches with a nest box. Um, <clears throat> they really like, you know, in nature, they live in the upper canopy of a tree and they're a bark gleaner. And so their box would go in a more wooded location than a Western bluebird and, and so forth. There's some other information here. Um, the Western bluebird itself, you know, we're calling out what they're eating here and um, that they're a ground gleaner and a lower canopy forager. So that makes more sense why they like semi-open grasslands and with scattered trees and vineyards and so forth. Um, and we show these different, um, um, what the nest box, nest, what the nest looks like in the nest box because each bird builds a different nest. So it's, even if the bird isn't there, when you check the box, you can, you can uh, figure it out often. And then um, in the last lesson, we talked about how chickadees were, uh, can be attracted into apple orchards. And um, they are a, a lower canopy gleaner and forager, but they, but they like wooded areas. They are um, mostly foraging in trees. So just a lower part of it. And you can see their moss, they have a, a moss kind of nest, which is very distinctive. Um, on the back of that table, it talks about how native birds can use nest shelves and also building eaves. And um, Alyssa is gonna talk uh, about birds and strawberries as uh, one of her topics. And, and I know she's gonna call out barn swallows. So um, just wanted you to um, think about how you farmers can support barn swallows by just allowing them to nest in buildings. Um, they are insectivores, They're, they eat lots of different kinds of insects. And um, yeah, and I think I'm going to, uh, let's see, just share, there's my email uh, address. If you have any questions that come up after today that you wanna, um, wanna send me, I'd love to hear from you and I'm, I'm going to stop and um, I think we could run the poll now if um, if you are ready to do that. We're going to ask you a couple questions just to get you to think about um, what we just talked about. Yeah, so as you should see, a quiz should have just popped up on your screen titled Joanne Quiz. Um, 
go ahead and fill that out. It's just a couple of simple questions. In the meantime, Joanne, we did have a question from Patty in the chat. She asks, I'd like more info on insect control in cattle herds. We have many barn and cliff swallows, but the crew dislikes how they poop on the equipment in the sheds. How can I present the value of birds to keep this from happening? Yeah. Well, that um, handout will help um, describe, you know, what actually they're eating. And uh, and Alyssa's presentation, she's going to uh, um, elaborate on that. I think there there can be a problem with um, these birds uh, dropping feces on things. And um, so I know I've. I've seen how you can discourage the birds from um, before they start nesting. You can discourage them from that, like say a cliff swallow that'll nest under the eaves on one side of your building, maybe um, right where the door is and, and there's a lot of feces there. You could put up some kind of netting that discourages them from nesting there and then they, sometimes will move over and nest on another side of the building if the, if the climate conditions are, are right, if it's not too hot there. Um, I know one time uh, a grower um, told me that they were also, they had barn swallows in their barn. And um, the thing that we don't want is to have like in a, say a vegetable production operation, you wouldn't want to have the swallows dropping feces on um, on materials you're using like a box that you're gonna pack your produce in. But in a cattle operation, it's, you know, is it, you could put what this grower had done was take, uh, took a tarp and um, strung it below the birds, but up high enough that it wasn't in the way. And so it kept uh, the feces off of, um, off of their equipment. So maybe that, could also help with, um, yeah, yeah, with uh, your crew that isn't so keen on having these birds around. Great, thank you, Joanne. And I also directed, of course, in all of our discussions, uh, future lessons are gonna build on the topics as we go along. So the more of these lessons that you catch, the stronger information you'll find on maybe a more particular question that you have. So I think we're about ready to wrap up the quiz here for Joanne. Um, so if you haven't filled that out, please do so. And then um, Joanne, if you wanted to just quickly uh, review those questions. Sure, um, the first one, is it true that nest boxes do the following in vineyards? Yes, it's true that they increase bluebird numbers. It's true that they increase predation on insects. And it's true that they decrease the number of mosquitoes in the vineyard. Um, the next one, which statements are true about insectivorous birds and walnuts? Um, let's see, uh, semi-natural landscape cover increases bird predation, yes. Older walnut trees increase bird predation, yes. White-breasted nut hatches can't use nest boxes. And that it, uh, they can use nest boxes. So it looks like most everybody got that one right. Um, so good. There you go. Um, I think we're, I'm done. I'm going to hand it off to Alyssa now. Okay, great. I have some slides to share with you. So let me just get that going. Okay, are you seeing my big slides? Everything looks good? Yeah, okay, great. Um, well, uh, I'm gonna continue on the same topic that Joanne was talking about, and I'm gonna cover some of my work in the California Central Coast, um, as well as some other researchers. So I wanted to get started um, just by showing you two very different farms, um, because we've been talking a lot about farms as habitat. So. In this first picture, this is a monoculture. 
um, in Watsonville. And it's kind of all strawberries as far as the eye can see. And then in contrast on this next slide, this is a diversified farm. Um, so we have different crop types, natural vegetation. Um, you can see trees and other crops like orchard crops in the surrounding landscape. Um, so these are both strong, both farms that grow strawberries that are not very far apart, but they have totally different resources for birds. And so if you can imagine if we have these farms right next to each other, the monoculture farm on the left might support species like a European starling or brewer's blackbird, um, which are species that, you know, do well around humans and um, kind of do well in these intensive ag landscapes. But that diversified farm on the right that has a lot more different kinds of resources, here we also see a more diverse bird community and we see species that wouldn't show up in a more intensive landscape. So in this talk, I'm going to be going through how um, the farming practices and the landscape change the bird community. And then because we have those different bird communities, we also get different ecosystem services and disservices from birds. And I'll be talking through this with a few different stories about my work in California lettuce systems, strawberry systems, and then other folks work in cacao and coffee systems. So I wanna get started with my work in lettuce systems in the central coast, there you can see a map. Um, that's the Monterey Bay and we've got sites from Santa Cruz down to the Salinas area. And we worked on um, 30 organic lettuce farms. And here we use bird surveys to understand the bird community on the farm. So we're out in farm fields um, observing which uh, species we saw and how many of them. And then we use statistical models to account for variation in detecting birds. Um, we looked across differences in local diversity. So thinking about those two farms I showed you at the beginning. So differences in local farming practices and then differences in the surrounding landscape when it came to ungrazed habitat. So trees, shrubs, white parian areas, wetlands, as well as surrounding grazed habitats. So when we looked across local diversification, we saw that more diversified farms supported more bird species. We didn't see much of a change in the conservation value of those bird communities. And here conservation value, um, it incorporates the population size, um, the distribution and other components of variability. So a species like a European starling that's non-native would have low conservation value. But a species like an oak titmouse, which Joanne mentioned before, um, that is a species that is of higher conservation value. And then when we looked at the ungrazed habitat in the surrounding landscape, as there was more of that ungrazed habitat, we also saw an increase in species richness and we saw birds that were of higher conservation value. And then when we looked at surrounding grazed areas, um, we saw an increase in conservation value, but that is probably because we have a few species that tend to be grassland specialists in this system. So overall, those surrounding ungrazed areas promote bird conservation, and we see more benefits for the ungrazed areas than we do see for the grazed areas. Now, if we think about kind of what are the changes in communities as you add in more ungrazed semi-natural area around the farm, um, again, in an intensive landscape, you have more blackbirds and starlings. And then as you add in more ungrazed semi-natural habitat, you have these more diverse bird communities. Um, and so a really important difference in these communities is those birds on the left are often associated with livestock. And we know from a recent study that birds that are associated with livestock tend to carry higher food safety risks. So they are more likely to have um, foodborne pathogens like Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter. And then those more diverse bird communities that we see on the right there, um, they're less likely to form big flocks. And so flocking birds is something that growers are really paying attention to and can, um, you know, as birds descend on crop fields, they can cause crop damage if there's big flocks and they could also cause contamination if they defecate on the crops. 
So here we see added benefits, not just for bird conservation, but also in terms of food safety. So as we add in more ungrazed semi-natural habitat around farms, we see bird communities that are less likely to flock. And those species um, are also not species that are livestock associated. So those surrounding ungrazed areas decreased bird flocks. And now I wanna talk a little bit more about the, the livestock association that I met. So in a recent study, um, we put together work from all across the Western US to look at which kinds of birds are most likely to present a risk to food safety. And so what we found was that those birds that are associated with livestock, that was the biggest trait that came out to increase food safety risks. So here we're looking at um, the probability of birds carrying Campylobacter, which is a common foodborne pathogen. Um, and it was much higher for those birds that are livestock associated and those that aren't. And then we also saw that insectivorous birds compared to birds that eat other things are less likely to carry Campylobacter. So here um, we have the species that are associated with livestock carry higher food safety risks, but insectivorous birds like those that use nest boxes do not carry higher food safety risks. Um, so here there's definitely an opportunity to promote birds with nest boxes that will provide pest control without increasing food safety risks. Next, I wanna tell you about some of our work in strawberry systems. So birds can um, provide pest control and those benefits, but as Joanne mentioned, they could also eat some beneficial insects or they could consume crops directly. Birds love strawberries. Um, and then finally, birds could contaminate crops through fecal contamination. So no one wants to eat a strawberry that's contaminated, but additionally, um, bird feces could carry foodborne pathogens. So in this study, we um, again are in the central coast and worked on 21 different organic strawberry farms. And we looked across those gradients, um, so differences in farm management practices, differences in local diversity, as well as differences in semi-natural habitat surrounding the farm. And here we quantified bird services and disservices to strawberry, including pest control. Um, one of the ways that we did this, just like in Sasha Heath's work, was that we used a bird exclusion experiment to compare um, what happens when you have birds versus when you don't have birds. So here you can see those PVC pipes um, form a cage over the strawberry beds, and then there's mesh netting, um, so birds are excluded. But then there's an area right next to it where birds do have access. So to understand the impact of birds, we compared those two areas. And then every week we harvested strawberries. So some of the strawberries had bird damage and then some berries were damaged by other kinds of invertebrates um, like ligus bugs, slugs. And part of this project, we looked at over 10,000 berries. What we found here was that the economic impact of birds on the strawberry systems had to do with both the surrounding semi-natural habitat as well as the position of the strawberry crop in a field. So we found an interactive effect. Um, these graphs can be a little hard to interpret, so I'm gonna walk you through a story here to show you what happens in these different landscapes. Um, so if we have a simple landscape, that is a farm that does not have much conserved habitat around it, um, what we see is that birds are causing some damage to crops at the edges of fields, like you can see in red here. But then see how the color changes as you move towards the middle of the field and you see blue? In the middle of the field, birds are providing pest control and really providing services. We didn't see the same kind of effect in a landscape that had more conserved habitat. So in the bottom there, you can see in green, um, that semi-natural areas around the farm. On this farm, we sort of saw just a muted effect across the farm. Um, so we didn't see that severe damage, but we also didn't see the same really strong benefits in field centers. One way to think about how the surrounding landscape can impact um, pest control 
is to think about adding and removing habitat. So I'm gonna show you what happens if we take these farms and then switch the landscapes. So um, if we have the farm on the top and we add in habitat, and then the farm on the bottom, we take away habitat, we see that when habitat's added, we can decrease bird costs by 23%. And then if we're taking away habitat, so if we have habitat removal, bird costs would be increased by 76% on this farm. And so we do see a huge difference as far as how surrounding landscape mediates the effect that birds have. And then also in this study in strawberry systems, I wanna show you a little bit about the work that we did catching birds in mist nuts and then taking fecal samples and looking at the DNA in the feces to understand what birds are eating and then also what pathogens they might be carrying. Um, so this is similar to Julie Jedlicka's work in Western bluebirds. We use the same type of approach. Um, so what we found here is that when you have farms that are surrounded by more semi-natural habitat, birds are less likely to eat strawberries. Um, so you can see in the photos on the left, though, there's some house finches that have strawberry bills stuck to their, or strawberry seeds stuck to their bills. They've been eating strawberries. So here we see that surrounding semi-natural areas reduced bird damage to strawberries. Um, we also looked at pathogens. So we found very low pathogen incidence in birds. Um, we only found one bird out of over a thousand samples that had Shiga toxin producing E. coli, which is the kind that can cause disease in humans. No birds carried salmonella and three and a half percent of birds were carrying Campylobacter. Um, again, we saw a positive protective effect of semi-natural habitat around the farm. So on farms that had more habitat, birds were less likely to carry that pathogen Campylobacter. So again, surrounding semi-natural areas reduced pathogen prevalence, just like they reduced crop damage. Um, so we put together all of the different ways that birds can impact crops into this multifunctionality index. Um, so here we're saying birds are more multifunctional if they provide pest control, but don't damage crops or carry foodborne pathogens. So we saw that birds were more multifunctional or providing more benefits on farms that had more surrounding habitat. So semi-natural areas promote bird benefits. And then we asked which species are the most multifunctional. And here I wanna highlight barn swallows as Joanne discussed earlier. Um, we saw that barn swallows were really the most likely to be providing benefits without being associated with crop damage or pathogens. Um, so they were really likely to provide pest control, but not have food safety risks. <clears throat> so to kind of sum up these um, two studies from California, we found that by conserving habitat and farmlands, um, we can support bird conservation. We can also mitigate food safety risks, and we can decrease crop damage from birds and increase yields and profits for growers. Um, I want to also cover those couple of other studies that I mentioned in the beginning. Um, so these are studies that are from other researchers and other systems, but I just wanna highlight that these bird benefits um, are not unique to California systems and really do extend to other crop types and geographies. So this first study um, is in cacao in Indonesia. And here they were also using exclosures. So, across 15 different cacao agroforestry plots, um, that difference in the, in the amount of shade cover, researchers set up these similar um, bird exclosures. Now here, the crop's a lot bigger, so they have much bigger cages. And they had cages that were down in the daytime to exclude birds. They also had cages that were only down at night to exclude bats, and then cages that were all the time to exclude both birds and bats. And they looked at um, insect abundance and then cacao yields. So first they saw that when you excluded birds or bats, you saw reduced <coughs> cacao yields. They also saw the same kind of pattern when it came to the number of harvested cacao pods. So in this study, um, they found that birds 
and bats increased yield in cacao. And they found that when birds and bats were excluded, the crop yield actually decreased by 31%. So a really significant decrease in crop yield if you don't have those natural pest control providers as birds and bats in the system. And so finally, I wanna tell you about coffee plantations, switching over to Costa Rica. And this is a study um, in sun coffee systems, so they didn't have very much shade cover, um, focusing on two different plantations that had different amount of forest in the surrounding landscape. And they did the same thing as that last cacao study. So they had exposures to look at both bird and bat mediated pest control. And then they were focused on um, the main pest in the system, the coffee berry borer. And so what they found was that um, there really wasn't much of a difference in the berries that were infested with the berry borer before the wet season. So those bars represent, um, you know, coffee berries that had where birds could access them and where birds could not access them. And the same for bats. So not really much of a difference before the wet season. But after the wet season, on the left there, you can see um, that there was a difference. Birds really made a big difference for providing pest control in coffee. And then they also made a difference um, in the dry season after. So here we saw that birds, but not bats, reduced coffee berry borer damage. Um, and then they also in this study looked at the abundance of birds that were likely to eat the coffee berry borer. And here they saw that there were more of those borer eating birds on farms that had more forest cover around them. And so here what you can see is the green represents patches of forest in the landscape. Um, and the yellow and red is the coffee plantation. So the red shows that there's higher bird abundance near those forest patches. They saw um, the same kind of pattern as far as the number of berries that were damaged by the coffee berry borer. So when there was more forest cover, less of the coffee berries were damaged. And here you can see the same kind of map where red at the edges of those forest patches shows how many berries were saved. So really the pest control benefits um, were more concentrated really close to those patches of conserved forest habitat. Uh, so forest cover increased boar eating birds and it decreased boar damage. And so to wrap up for those um, shade grown crops that we just talked about, coffee and cacao, birds and bats increased yields in cacao and it really didn't matter about the forest cover in the surrounding landscape. They always had that positive effect. And then forest cover can promote bird pest control in coffee systems. And so with that, um, I wanna thank all the collaborators, students, mentors, funders, and you guys for listening today, everyone that's been involved in the project. And um, I think we're gonna do some questions, but I also wanted to note that if we don't get to all of them, please feel free to email me. My email is there in the upper right-hand corner and I'd be happy to answer any questions over email later. Fantastic. Yes. Thank you, Alyssa. So um, there should be a poll now on everyone's screen that has a couple of questions related to what Alyssa just talked about. And while folks are filling out that poll, there were indeed a few questions that popped up in the chat. So someone had asked about if there was any information specific to chimney swifts in any of the research that you have completed. Mm, I don't remember seeing any, um, but I know they are insectivorous birds like the swallows. And so it's very likely that um, they would be beneficial. Yes, and 
you know, I directed them as well to a publication that we have that does cover some similar bird species, as well as a future lesson that will maybe focus more on that. Um, there was a question from Juan about asking the difference between migratory and non-migratory birds related with these farming practices. Um, yeah, let's see. Well, um, some birds are resident and some are migratory and um, um, I guess it depends on, um, you know, what their needs are when like the, the birds that are migratory um, will arrive and start looking for places to build their nests. Um, whereas the residents might, um, might have might take longer you know they might be looking in the winter and figuring out well that nest box looks really great I'm gonna plan on using that much earlier um so I don't know Alyssa what do you do you have something to add I think it can be very crop and system specific um so what we see is that when migratory birds are coming in, at least in these California systems where I work, um, you know, those are species that are going to get to work right away and start nesting. And then we're going to see that they have an increased demand for food resources. So if that's insects, we might actually see a bump in pest control um, because we have birds that are breeding and have higher energy requirements and, and needing to feed nestlings. Um, but it also means that sometimes you have birds that are migrating through that might be in bigger flocks. And so it really depends on your area. Um, I would say that's very, very specific to where you are. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. And as um, Shelley mentioned, we're going to wrap up that poll really quick. Um, there was another question that was asking about cats and cat predation of birds and deterrence. Um, we will cover the information um, in a future lesson, but just any quick thoughts from either of you, Joanne or Alyssa? Um, well, um, yes, uh, if you're putting up bird boxes, you do not want to put them in cat territory. Um, and uh, while cats uh, do help with pest control around barns. If you don't need them for that, you might, con and you love cats, I love cats, um, you might consider the next cat you get to keep them indoors. It's easy to do that when they're kittens, and um, that's what we have done, and uh, actually they have a catio, um, so they get to go outside and uh, a, a netted um, side yard where they can dream about catching the birds they can see. But um, for because cats kill some estimates are a billion birds a, a year. And um, it, yeah, they're, they're just really good at what they do. Yeah. Wonderful. And a question just came in that I think is kind of pertinent to Alyssa, like some of the questions that you asked in the poll. Um, so instead of covering maybe the answers for that, um, responding to Anthony's question about aside from blue bird boxes in the vineyard, is there anything that could be done through management of our wildlife corridor or along forest edges to increase the populations of insectivorous birds? Um, well, um, yeah, conserving those riparian areas are definitely important. Um, I mean, any kind of uh, corridor is good um, for uh, mammals moving through, but also I know uh, another study Sasha Heath has done looked at uh, how corridors affected nesting success in, in sparrows. And birds that weren't didn't have weren't um, nesting in corridors had less success. Um, you know the corridors just provide cover and uh, safety for them, uh, so they're less stressed probably. And um, I think she did look at stress issues. Uh, 
So, and then, you know, this habitat is supporting other kinds of organisms. I know riparian habitat supports a um, parasitic wasp that is important at, at um, decreasing, forget the pest, it's some vineyard pest. Um, so there, you know, the habitat has multi, multi benefits and, um, and as much as we can, we should try and conserve and, and even expand it when possible. Did you have any thoughts on that at all, Alyssa? I think that's great what Joanne said, is really conserving those areas. Um, another thing that you could think about too is habitat connectivity. So you're conserving the parts that is maybe near your property, but kind of taking like a larger landscape view and thinking about where would birds be going to and from if they're using your corridor and, and how those kinds of riparian areas connect throughout the larger landscape. Um, and I'd say another important part of that would be just reduced use of pesticides, which of course are intended to decrease insect populations. Um, but you want to make sure there's also um, insects available for birds to eat. So not getting rid of all of them would be the goal. Yes, and that is the same thing for supporting beneficial insects. They need um, some pest insects to survive on, especially during the downtimes when there's very few things to eat. So there's, of course, always more questions and oftentimes we have time to answer. Um, but I, I did want to bring up um, this question from Morgan because I, I think it's related to Alyssa, how you introduced some studies where um, those simpler landscapes had more um, non-native, maybe pest birds versus the more complex. So the question is, I grow a diverse system surrounded by monoculture farms. I see diverse beneficial birds, but also starlings and red-winged blackbirds dominate. What advice do you have for regaining balance? Yeah, that can be tough when um, you have a more diversified operation that's in a more intensive landscape. Um, there, your, your farm could act as really great habitat for birds um, and attract diverse kinds of birds, but including some of the species that you might be more concerned about. Um, I would say they're really, again, taking this more of a landscape approach and thinking about um, opportunities for conservation in the surrounding landscape. And, um, you know, thinking about potentially working with other landowners in the area and talking about some of the benefits that um, kind of creating little patches of habitat and scaling those up could have for um, you and your neighbors could be one way to approach that. Wonderful. So I'm um, going to just advance the slide here. Um, we are in the last few minutes of our presentation. We'll continue to answer um, some questions here, um, but we did want you to fill out a final poll. Um, and this is, again, important for us to be able to track participation for our funders, as well as to improve our classes for the future. Um, so to continue some of the questions that have been brought up, um, of course, this is a webinar for folks that are joining us from all over the United States. So there uh, is a question about directing um, folks towards any Midwest or Northeast specific research as they're located in Western Pennsylvania. So oftentimes very specific locations are on the cusp of other areas. Mm, um, let's see. I know um, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is based up in New York. And um, while they have national information on their website, uh, many different websites they have all, all about birds is one of them. And um, Nest Watch is a really great, uh, another site of theirs. Um, 
and they also have birds of the world which you have to pay for but it's also full top full of information um so i know that's more kind of national but i sometimes it has a, a flavor of more um east coast uh so maybe if you haven't checked that out that could be helpful i would add to you that um yeah that through Penn State, there might be some really great extension services that you could use. So to check into that and see if they might have some more regional specific advice for you for management. Wonderful. So um, I'd like to just ask either the presenters if you had any kind of final takeaways that you wanted to leave our participants with today. Oh, well, I guess um, uh, consider if you are a farmer and watching, consider how you can support birds with um, nest boxes or allowing them to nest on structures and or um, conserving or, or restoring some habitat, that natural habitat that had been on the farm or planting native hedgerows, all these things can help to support um, the kinds of beneficial birds we wanna see and we want to, um, for them to help you as well. And Alyssa, did you have, you wanna add anything? Sure, I completely agree with what you're saying. Um, and some of the conversations that I've had with folks that have had, um, you know, for one reason or another are hoping to deter birds. I would just say that that's often really not a feasible option. Um, so our goal with a lot of our research is thinking about because birds are interacting with farms, how can we manage so that they are the most beneficial? And that that's really kind of reframing how we think about birds on the farm, um, not like whether or not we want them, but since they're going to be part of the farming landscape, how can we manage so that we are getting um, the most benefits from them? Wonderful, thank you. I would like to thank our presenters for all this wonderful information today. And I'd also, of course, like to thank everyone here for asking all these wonderful questions within the chat today. I encourage you to uh, visit our website as of course this is uh, lesson two of 10 total lessons we're providing. Our next lesson will be in April covering insect eating birds supported by nest boxes and buildings. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a wonderful day.